And then I realized that resonance was, uh, was the, probably the best way of, of, of touching it because it's a kind of processual dynamic. I will give you your voice, right? Make yourself heard. So I think it's the desire to overcome alienation. It's born out of a sense of alienation and driven by the desire for resonance. Well, you know, I mean, when I wrote the acceleration book, I already said I consider this to be part of a sociology of the good life, right? Because uh, the the question how do I want uh, or how do I want to live is almost equivalent with how do I want to spend my time or how do I spend my time. So when I wrote acceleration, I was already thinking about uh, the way of how we relate to the world, right? So in a certain sense. You could say this, the, the, the question of, of the resonance book was always present even when I wrote the acceleration uh, thing. But nevertheless, on the other hand, um, yes, I had written the acceleration and then people thought, oh, Hartmut Rosa is a, is a kind of uh, advocating slowness, right? Just slow down, right? They even called me the guru of deceleration. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't think that just slowness is a good solution to the acceleration problem. I still don't think it's per se the solution for, for two reasons. I mean, one is you know, we cannot just slow down and leave everything as it is, right? And my sociological analysis is that we need speed in order to uh, reproduce the structure of society and the status quo, right? So you cannot just slow down and, and, and in a growth society. But the other thing is that I didn't even think and I don't think that slowness is an end in itself. A slow internet connection is uh, just uh, painful, right? No one likes that, right? It doesn't help much. So I thought about when, when so I don't so I thought well it's wrong to think that speed is uh, bad and slowness is good so so uh, so that's why when I wrote uh, acceleration et alienation uh, trying to say well speed the problem with speed is that it changes the way we we relate to the world that's already the later book and when it creates alienation and then I had the problem that I thought, well, what is the opposite of alienation? It certainly isn't slowness, right? I mean, a non-alienated way of being is... Uh, um, and I realized that when people uh, sp dream of, speak of s uh, slow, slow food and uh, all these other things, what they have in mind is not slowness in itself, but a different way of relating to other people, for example, in dialogue, right? I mean, to really relate to them and not just tell me what time it is or so on. And, um, a different way of relating to their own work and to nature and probably also to their own body or soul, right? Not just in the sense, oh, I have a pain here, I need to get something or I have a, I want to have a tattoo on here, but a, a way of, of what, I, what I now call resonance. So my idea is we dream of a different way of relating to the world and of being in the world and I didn't have a concept for it, and so I slowly developed the concept of resonance as, as an answer, not, ne not necessarily to acceleration, but to alienation, right? But since acceleration causes alienation, I thought I need the opposite term of this, and this could be resonance. And then I realized, and, then there, and there was another thing actually, I wanted to have a conception of the good life that is not in itself a kind of permanently driving the growth and speed um, game, right? And I thought, even if you are not materialistic, but like Amartya Sen, the philosopher, who, who thinks that the quality of life can be measured in the capability bundles or so, right? Then it's the, you still have the horizon, if I have more capabilities, my life gets better. And this permanently pushes you towards increasing your, uh, your horizon of what is available and attainable, and therefore, uh, I thought resonance could provide us with a conception of the good life that is not intrinsically driving the motor of growth and speed. I didn't start with resonance, as I said, I ended up with it, right? <laughs> at first I had, you know, the, the, my starting point really was when do we feel at home in the world? In German you can actually put it maybe a bit nicer, but when fühlen wir uns getragen, carried, right? Or, or carried in the world, when do you feel at home? And when do we feel thrown into a kind of hostile or, or, or at least silent universe. So I started with this opposition, feeling at home versus feeling alienated, right? Mm -hmm. And then I realized, well, feeling at home has something to do not with having or so, not even just with security. It's responsivity, right? 
when I feel that 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 this that the world is somehow answering, I, I can, you know, this is how I arrived at the double double conception of probably. Re so I had at first responsivity, right, and and uh, with responsivity, it's a kind of it's a two way thing. Uh, I feel I, I feel called upon, so to speak, but also capable of reaching out. So it's so I reach you, you reach me. It's reaching each other, and then I realized that resonance was was the probably the best way of of, of touching it because it's a kind of processual dynamic, and a very fine, almost elusive concept, which I which I liked very much. And it's not communication either. I agree yeah. with this, right? Because you can communicate in a very alienated way, or at least in a you know I call mute relationships, and you can respond in mute relationships, and you can um, communicate. You know, you ask me what time it is, and I say it's three or so. Or but we can actually even have a dialogue like this, which is not with which is not resonance. I mean, you know, the way it would be you ask a question, I say what I always say, and maybe in my mind I'm already somewhere else, right? <laughs> so that would be responding and communicating without resonance. So resonance has this, for me, the decisive point, it has this transformative capacity, right? You open up to something and you don't know what the result would be. Of course, I was I was influenced by the recognition theory of Axel Honneth and also of Charles Taylor, right? And I have high esteem for the, for them. I mean, they influenced me a lot, and I, I I thought they have a. It's I thought there's a lot of truth in what they are saying, particularly I mean in the version of Axel Honneth, right? He says, and I always thought for a long time I thought about it because I, for me he says. Well, as a human being, I always long for recognition. I need to be loved by someone in order to have the, the necessary um, self-confidence. Yeah. And I need to be respected as a moral person. I mean, I find this very interesting, actually, right? If, if, if there is no one who says, I know you don't lie, it's almost impossible for you to develop the moral capacity to not lie, right? If everyone says, oh, Peter lies anyway, it's probably impossible for him, right, and not to lie. So, so Honneth says we have to be respected as moral and legal persons, and and we have to be esteemed. Someone at some point needs to say, "Oh, you did this well," right, or, or something like that. I thought, well, you're totally right there, but there are some moments in my life and some aspirations which are which have nothing to do with recognition, right? Like what I experience when I listen to music. I thought, well, there's something happening there, and it's vitally important for 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 my life. Really. Really. And actually, I also believe for society. And you cannot couch this in terms of, of recognition, right? Mm. So that's why I say, well, recognition is only between human beings. But resonance is also our relationship to things and, and to the world as such. And I think it's this bodily and, and a thingly a dimension which probably drew me to the physical metaphor, right? I always wanted to say it is something materially, uh, material and embodied, right? Yeah. And, uh, so probably that's, but uh, and also because actually I don't know. I mean I mean I, I'm not not completely sure. I mean acceleration already was a physical concept, right? Which I so I always I seem to be drawn to physics, right? <laughs> <laughs> to explain uh, social um, phenomena. But of course, a resonance is also an acoustic phenomenon. It has a lot to do with music, and that's why I really believe that that hearing. I, I believe that hearing is much more important than uh, than seeing, right? And that's why the screen is might be is limited, right? It's the connection to the world. The main thread is rather. Uh, or, uh, through the audio audio channel, right, yeah. and and uh, maybe also even to physical touch. Right? On the one hand, I would say no, it's not a spiritual uh, concept because uh, because it's 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 um, it's totally essential to us as human beings, right? It's a very it's a it's a it's a when you look at how a child develops, then you see that that um, that the the way a child interacts with the world is looking for resonance and finding it right by the touch of someone who carries you, but then of course through the eyes and through the voice, and you discover this as a baby, long before you are a language animal or a reasonable animal, and you that's again YouTube is quite useful sometimes, right? <laughs> Uh, if, if, because they have videos, for example, still face experiment, right? I mean, the idea is, or, or the fact is, that when an adult, let's say the mother, right, or some significant person, uh, interacts with the baby, you can really see how the baby, with with the with the with the arms and with the face, with the eyes, with the voice, tries to get in contact. And the mother or the the grown the adult, even if you're a, a foreigner, right, a, a, an, an alien person, you it's almost impossible not to re react to it, right, with your face and with the eyes and with the voice and everything. And if you don't do this, 
uh, they call it still face experiment. You do not threaten the baby, you just stand mm -hmm. still. The baby really is in panic. It really gets in complete panic. It starts to cry because it, because it cannot get into resonance. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's not a spiritual concept. It's our reality. That's what we do all the time. When you look into someone's eyes, there is, it's a direct, you, f you feel it like Levinas or Bubo or others have called it, right? You feel the call. There is a call which you are a thought, so, which you are supposed to answer. But I think it does explain spiritual, uh, spiritual needs and spiritual, spiritual ideas because I, what I call the vertical dimension is that we need to have a sense of how we are connected with existence in itself or with the ultimate reality or with uh, what um, 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 Jas, Karl Jaspers call the, calls the, das Umgreifende, the, 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 the encompassing totality, so to speak. And I, I think resonance is the idea that there is a connection, an existential resonance between me and the world, right? And, and that's, that's why I actually think, you know, because I'm a sociologist, I'm not a theologian, right? So I think sociology or the sociology of resonance can provide you with an idea of what religion does and, and, and how it works almost, right? Um, the, mind, the mindfulness thing, I mean, it, it comes in different versions. I mean, there are uh, some things which I totally dislike about it, right? One is that they, um, I mean, uh, that it's actually totally non-spiritual. They use it as a technique to be more successful in life, right? How you become even more, whatever, creative faster or so, or stress resilient. And, uh, and that, I think, is just a technique to, to be faster and, 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 and stay in the hamster wheel. So I dislike that. And the other thing is, uh, it puts everything on the subject, right? It's you who has to be in the right set of mind, then everything will work. So it's non-political and totally individualistic. And um, and then the other and the other point is that it, it that they tell you if you are in the right right set of mind, you will be in resonance or achtsam, mindful towards everything. So I call it, you know, on the one hand, you have this kind of individualistic individualistic narrowing down. It's all in your mind. And secondly, you have this universalistic extension. You have to be mindful towards everything equally. So I think this is not getting into resonance for someone. But on the other hand, I think the mindful, I mean, this, what you can call, I don't know in German, we call it the whole movement of achtsamkeit. Of course, it has different versions, like some go back to Buddhism. And, and there are practices of trying to reconnect in existential ways with life, right? And I even think, uh, of course, I mean, resonance has, Resonance is not something in the subject, it's between you and the world. But of course there are preconditions on the subjective side, being in the right disposition, being open to being touched or called and being capable of responding in a way that is not manipulative. And of course a lot of this mindfulness uh, techniques have to do with this and I don't object to them. So I think that's, there's a connection between resonance and that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I mean the way I mean it's I mean we kind of permanently look for information, of course, right? It's not so much that they force it upon us, but you you feel it when you have a smartphone in the pocket, right? You somehow feel drawn to oh, let's check the news and what's going on and who who addresses me and so on. And I think we can really, if you want to explain this, you can really see it's the desire for resonance. And I believe it's what I call it. It's a kind of simulation of resonance, right? I, I'm looking for something that touches me, and then you read oh, there has been a, I don't know a plane crash. Also, and it somehow touches you, right? You, you almost feel it bodily, and then if you if you if you comment on it or put a like or dislike or so, then you feel self-efficacy in in a way of answering. So, so this permanent flow of information and the reaction to information has somehow it has the guise, the the the, the form, the shape of resonance, right? Something touches me, and I answer to it. But you see that you are not really transformed by it. And the question is, how does it touch you? Only on a very superficial level, right? So I would really say, yes, by playing this game of permanently communicating and exchanging information and, and reading and reacting to it, we somehow simulate resonance without really achieving it. You see this. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you see this because uh, we, we, uh, we get, get off kind of addicted. You have to be there all the time. Otherwise, you feel you're lost. Your friends forget about you and, uh, and, and so on. And the, other, yeah. and the other thing is that it, it, creates, it almost does create a form of alienation. Most people say so, right? When you surf the internet for two hours or three and then you turn it off, you somehow feel drained, <laughs> right? So I think something is wrong and it's, it's not really the, the real form of resonance. So yes, I do think this game of permanently responding and, 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 and 
testing and typing is, um, is somehow preventing us from being really in resonance, which means opening yourself up in a way which makes you even vulnerable and, 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 and but um, which uh, has the capacity to, to transform you. I mean, if we do away with it, what do we do then? I actually think you can ask the question the other way around. What are the, what are the contexts in which you do not even feel tempted to check your, your smartphone, right? And then you actually realize whenever you are in resonance with someone or something, you don't feel tempted to check the information available. And that, of course, it's different for different people. But I realized when I really, I love, I love the mountains when I walk in the Alps, I really don't feel tempted to check Amazon or whatever it is all the time. And also when you're in a good conversation and, and, and when, you, when you are in an interesting concert. Actually, when I go to a concert at first, I might be tempted to check or write. But then I realize when, when I get into resonance, this desire is going away immediately. And it's the same in, with religious experiences. When you're really into it, then, then, then this desire disappears. So, so probably one would have to answer your question by, by on this negative route, right? I mean, get, getting really in whenever... I mean, if we did not, if we, if we did away, if we do digital detox, then hopefully, we go back to those axes of resonance which really are resonant for us. Oh, I think that's definitely the case. I, I think politicians really, I mean, it's not their fault. It's not that our politicians are stupid or something like that, right? But the way the game is played or polit politics works today, I think there's very much uh, of, of what you say. I mean, my main idea is really, or not, not my, one of my uh, core ideas is that generally for our, us as modern subjects, the world becomes like Herbert Marcuse did write that, and, but he drew on Max Scheler, the philosopher, right? The world becomes a point of aggression, he says. I find this really interesting because when you, when you, when you do our everyday lives, right, most of the time we work off a to-do list, right? So I have to get this done, I need to buy this, I need to answer that, I have to solve that problem, and I get this fixed or so. So, so it's permanently, the world comes to you as a point of aggression. I need to know this, I need to do this, and, and so on. And, uh, and resonance is a different orientation. It's not the aggression, how can I get it, how can I command it, right? Also, how, how can I master it? But listening and answering. And the problem with politicians is actually that the world is always coming to them very aggressively, right? So something happens somewhere, let's take the plane crash or whatever it is, and immediately the media ask the politicians, what's your take on it? And it's, it's actually done in a very, aggressive context, right? Make one mistake, right? just, just one <laughs> utterance, and you will have all the media and all the, uh, the public at your, f at your throat, actually, right? And, and even if, they, if you don't feel attacked like this, then you have to attack the others, right? You have to solve the problem, deal with it, sort it, categorize it. So I think politicians are really tempted to, uh, I mean, they always, they really forget what, what, what resonance is, I, I, I'd almost claim, right? And it's also, I think part of the problem is, I mean, one part of the problem is that politicians very often operate, for example, in talk shows, and there certainly you should not be touched by the arguments of the others and not transformed in your opinion. Uh, that would be a disaster for a politician, right? So what do you do? You wait for, you listen to the other, but you wait where he makes a small mistake or where you find the opening where I can kind of hit you. So that's aggression. And it's the same in parliamentary debates. And I think this is then taken to the streets, right? I mean, right, the right and the left try to actually not to listen and answer, but to, uh, to shout and make the other silent, right? And um, yes, therefore, poly and, and one last point. I mean, how are elections won? Well, we are approaching the European elections in that case. They are won by promising some form of increase, right? So, so, so politici political elections are done by claiming vote for me and you will have more jobs, vote for me and you will have uh, more flats, apartments, vote for me and you will have higher incomes, vote for me and you will have cleaner air. So it's always political, political competition is done in the logic of increase, of, of growth and, and, and acceleration right? and, and very rarely in the mode of resonance. You know, I think there is a kind of, I think all over Europe and maybe all over the world, there is kind of political frustration. And I think this frustration is uh, created by, by, by actually by a feeling of alienation, right? I mean, that it's somehow blind forces which steer us, right? 
And, and these blind forces are then kind of projected. I mean, Trump did it with Wall Street, for example. It's Wall Street, right? And, and, that may, and, and we do it very often with Brussels. It's some experts in bureaucracies in Brussels uh, who, uh, who uh, decide on our fate almost. And, then, and against this, you have the strong desire that you want to f actually feel yourself as a political subject to shape the world. And of course, this is my second condition of resonance, that you feel self-efficacy. Right, that, you, that you feel that you have a say in this, that we can shape the world. And this is why the Brexiteers, for example, they won their election with a slogan of take back control. I think it wasn't about the economic well-being, right? I think it's a misinterpretation if you take Brexit, but you can also take Trump. I do not believe people voted for Brexit because they thought they would be richer after that. Right? It was very unlikely that that would happen and people knew it. But they wanted to take back control. They wanted to have a voice and shape, collectively shape the world. And unfortunately, the, I think the division which, which I see is the division between those who say, well, the, the, the sphere of resonance is the national sphere, right? That's the sphere where you can listen and answer and do have self-efficacy so that we can shape the world. And Europe is the, the foe, right? The enemy. Uh, Europe is the thing which is a kind of bureaucracy in, in Brussels and therefore the cold machine. And then there are the others, and I, I count myself firmly in the other camp, uh, who say, well, no, if we really want to shape the, our society, our life, if, if we want to feel ourselves as political subjects, we have to do it on a European level. And it's exactly done through resonance. Listen to others who have another voice. They say something differently. They might even be Muslims, right? But it doesn't mean I have to give in and now we build minarets all over the place, right? I have my own voice, which I make then heard. And that creates this process. I really I think of Europe like, like as a concert. There are many different voices, but the idea is shaping politics together. I mean, something I, like, I dislike about, about mo actually current, the dominating conceptions in political and social theory are conceptions like, for example, Chantal Mouffe in uh, uh, Laclau on the left side or Carl Schmitt on the right side, right? They think of politics as a, as a, as a fight, right? They say that the essential, the essential, the core of politics is struggle. And this is, I think, very unfortunate because it, it immediately puts you in this mode of aggression. Okay, where's the enemy? I have to defeat him or her, right? And even if you are like, like Laclau and Muff coming from the left side, they say, well, we have to sell our project, our interests as the common good. It's a manipulative techniques. I mean, if you think in these terms about politics, we should not be surprised if you get more and more aggression and in the end even war. I think the heart of politics is not aggression and conflict. The heart of politics is shaping the world together. right? And of course, there we will have different opinions and different interests. But if you then can kind of transform uh, interests and opinions and the world in a resonant mode, everything would be good. So Europe needs more resonance. <laughs>
draw 10 years later, right? And our conception of the futures will also change. But my conception is, and that's how I would assess it, right? The common good is realized when the relationship between the citizens can be interpreted as a form of resonance and the relationship towards the environment and nature and the relationship towards history and towards temporality and then everything would be solved. <laughs>
to, to, to get touched and transformed in a way which you cannot control. Mm -hmm. And in a highly competitive environment where you are permanently short on time, the risk is much too high. Don't let yourself be touched. Guard yourself, defend yourself and be quick and fast. Don't listen and don't answer. So a society which says, okay, let's have competition on all levels of our existence. Competition between the kindergartens and the schools and the universities and even the single teachers at schools and everyone, the units in the hospital and, and, and every employee against every other employee or so on. The, the, it was always the idea, this makes us more efficient. The idea really was, if you have existential fear, then you will work really hard, which I think is true. You work hard, but you turn world into a hell. I mean, it's, it's, it's really true. And, and, and so I think, yes, the neoliberal project of, of putting competition everywhere and creating fear uh, is hostile to, uh, to the possibility of living a, a resonant life. And that's why I really think, if, if I have one, if I have something to tell to politicians, I would really say, well, change your mantra. Because they always say, we need more competition. You hear that from the left in Germany, at least from the Greens. It's the green mantra and it's also the neoliberal mantra of the liberals, right? And I would really say, well, no, go away from this. Let's, let's have less competition. Because, because who says we need more competition says we need less time. I think I can prove this mathematically, right? I mean, in competition, the measure is, um, uh, oh, it's achievement. And achievement, no, it's just, um, uh, it's just Leistung, it's achievement, right? And uh, Leistung, uh, achievement in English, and, and achievement is, is, uh, is work by time, right? So, so time is an essential element of the logic of competition. So who says I need more competition says I, I, I want to give you less time. So, uh, so you, you can either have more competition or less acceleration, but not both. Actually, I like. I find this amazing what Pope Francis wrote. Right, it has very many similarities on both ends. On the one hand, he is, seems like criticizes the acceleration logic or the growth logic, which I which I do. Yeah, yeah. And he also seems to suggest something similar, like 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 the resonance conception. So I do. So I do. So I have a lot of sympathy for that. And I I do think, you know, one thing is which is important is I don't actually. I don't put so much emphasis, I even am a bit in disagreement with my colleagues who say we need to shrink and decrease. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, I mean, well, maybe in some ecological sectors we need to, right, with the energy consumption or things like that, or with the output of oil, right. But, but you don't really convince people with this, so I think, well, the most important thing is that we get out of the blind necessity for increase. Right? I mean, the thing that we have to, in France and in the EU, everywhere, next year we have to produce more right, and faster than this year without changing anything. I mean, the, my formula for this is dynamic stabilization, that we have to uh, realize an increase in productivity and output and speed and innov innovativity just to keep what we have, the number of jobs and the companies and the, and the budget and, and actually the welfare system and the pension system and so on. This is the problem, right? So it's not that we necessarily need to decrease, but we need to get out of a situation which forces us to increase incessantly for without any end. That's totally idiotic and everyone sees it's idiotic, really. Uh, that doesn't mean that there might be other... You know, I think... I mean, actually, it creates a very difficult philosophical project because then the, the, the strongest opposition to my argument is that you could say, well, isn't it in human nature that we want to grow and develop, right, and, 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 and go forward? Yeah, so, and, and it's very hard to say no to that question. So I think yes. But I think the interesting thing is that that's, uh, on the one hand, this form of development is not quantitative, right? It's not an increase in, in some sense. And I would now really say, like, I mean, this sense of growth is that you that you that you that you um, that you actually that you increase in your capacity to 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 be open, right? To be reached and to reach out, and that's different from the growth logic we have right now. And when it comes to the environment, I think, I mean, for fifty years now, it's so frustrating. It's 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 killingly frustrating. For fifty years, the Club of Rome, right? We have this, and Europe, particularly Germany, for example, a lot of people took that up. The Green Party started, right? Mm -hmm. And after 50 years of debating the Club of Rome, Germany is still proud every year to produce more cars than the year before. Okay. And it's not just that we produce cars for China, which would be debatable enough, but even within Germany, every year we have more new cars than the year before. And, and when you look at the number of flights and planes, they explode. 
and, 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 the, and the politicians say we need that and the economists say hurrah, right? We, we, are, we have a strong economy. So I really think, okay, let's stop talking about saving the environment. We don't really want to do it and we don't certainly, we are not even close to it. Every year the, the, the balance gets worse and worse. So therefore I think we need a fundamental shift, not just some green technology. And this shift I think would be that we no longer consider nature, our relationship to nature should no longer be a relationship to nature as a resource, something we can use for our purposes or something we can reshape. But it's this fear of resonance which we need, which you experience when you are at the ocean or in the forest or in the mountains or so, right? Then all of a sudden you change the way you approach nature, not as something I, I want to control and not as something I'm afraid it, we might ru run out of it, but as this vibrant, necessary sphere of a, of, 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 an, uh, of, ein Gegenüber, of an, a kind of partner in dialogue, right, which, uh, which we need. So that would be my hope to, uh, to uh, sa save the ecology. Yes, I, I think it already is. I really think, I mean, that's something I debate with my leftist colleagues, right? Uh, because I say, no matter whether we live in capitalist, alienated work conditions, I mean, you know what, walk, uh, what Marx would call uh, the, the wage slavery, right? Even if you are a wage slave, if you want to use that language, right? You experience this kind of the resonant quality of your work very often. And that's what, uh, what sociologists find when they do interviews or studies on people working. And most people love their work. Yeah. And that's not just ideology or alienation, right? Because you feel, you, whatever you do, right? You, you have this kind of this encounter with some kind of resistant um, quality of the world. It never really does what you want, no matter what you do. When you write a text, the text is somehow resisting, right? But there you feel how in working with this thing, you feel uh, self-efficacy. I can reach out and do something and that what I do reshapes me. Actually, Marx, I think Marx did that very well, right? The early Marx, right? By working on and, uh, and shaping the world, you shape yourself and that's resonance, right? You don't have complete control over it. So I really, so my take is, we should focus on this because what I do know from empirical sociological studies is that almost all workers say, well, I love my work if I'm left to do it properly. But the permanent increase, the need to increase, be faster, be more productive, right? And, and don't, don't pay attention to the quality of what you do. That's what the bosses tell them. Don't pay attention to what you do and don't pay attention to the clients, right, on the other side. And this frustrates workers. So I think actually we, should, we could and should use their sense of resonance, their desire for a resonant way of work to reproduce the work sphere. So, 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 so to answer your question, I do not only think that work could be a sphere of resonance, it already is one. It's really true. I mean, the glo globalization has a certain economic logic and a distributional logic. So some win, some lose, right? And the, and and uh, and there is the there is the uh, uh, there is the the perception on uh, on the many social levels that well, this is a kind of game they cannot control, and in the end they will lose by right. Like like some like like you say, those who are not. I mean, there's a kind of global jet set elites who move all over the place. They are the beneficiaries, and those who stay in the place and are, and are not so capable of moving, they lose. But the thing is that this problem of uh, or this this uh, the unbalance is created, for example, by the free, by the by the logic of the financial markets, which within fractions of second, right, a kind of can redirect re 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 redirect this, the 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 flows of capital and of currencies and of money and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the logic of corporate globalization, you could call it, and of or, and of financial markets, which are running um, independently, havoc almost, right, which creates losers. And they, now they think, well, the problem why I lose are the foreigners coming, right? It's the people, and I really think that's a that's a that's a that's a confusion of levels. You fight the globalization on the wrong level because the interesting thing is when you look to Switzerland, for example, it was the same person, people in the, like the SVP, the Swiss Volks Party, People's Party, which is very right wing. It was run by a by a huge by, a, by one of the richest persons of Swiss, of Switzerland. He has profited all the time from economic globalization, and he has profited politically by going against globalization but on a different level let's keep all the foreigners out right so economically i would say you fight the wrong foe right it's, it's not like the what and trump it's exactly like trump certainly 
But I think there is another way which I call the double failure, the double mistake or the double thought illusion of right-wing populism and that has to do with resonance, right? Right-wing populism for me is what you say, is, is, is a sense of frustration and anger with the current system, right? Which is really driven by ressentiment, resentment, right? Yeah, yeah. And this resentment is very much, uh, that's why it has to do with globalization, against foreigners and everything that is not considered to be here, right? But when you, when you think of, so you see this kind of movement, anger directed against but well, actually, it's it's not driven by vision of the good, but 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 resentment, right? And you see this uh, when you look at the Trumpites, for example. It's resentments against uh, the Islam and Muslims. It's resentment against Mexicans. It's even resentments against blacks. It's resentment against Wall Street, right? All of these are somehow wrong. So I think, and it's the same with the Front National or with the Brexit or so. It's the sense that um, that the, that the, that uh, the things. Well, you know, okay. I mean, it's. A, I think it's 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 driven by the feeling of alienation. I do not have a voice, right? This what I call right-wing populism lives by the, by someone telling them, you know, no one hears you, no one sees you. That's exactly what Trump said, right? And Brexit too would take back control, for example, of Four National. I I will I will give you your voice, right? Make yourself heard. So I think it's the desire to overcome alienation. It's born out of a sense of alienation and driven by the desire for resonance. But now the double thought is this. Number one, the idea that alienation is caused by the aliens. Right? I mean, for example, in Germany, when you look at Eastern Germany, where, they, where, where, they, where they, the, the hostility to, or in Eastern Europe, like Hungary or so, they hardly have any foreigners. Right? But they think that the less foreigners they have, the more they think it's them who causes alienation. That's wrong, I believe. But what's even wronger is that they think those leaders like Trump, they give the, they give, they provide resonance. It's not true. When you when you when you shut out everything that speaks a different voice, then you don't hear anything with which you can get into resonance. There is nothing speaking to you. But what is worse, you do not hear your own voice because you want it to be fused in this one single voice of the leader. And that's what Trump said in his acceptance speech, which was very moving actually. He says, uh, those who are forgotten, those who no one hears, those who do not have a voice, I am your voice. I found this a very strong moment, right? <laughs> but he does not say, I'll give you, he does not say, I'll give you a voice, which makes you heard. He says, I am your voice. Basically says, shut up because I'm already the voice. So it's so that's the second mistake, right? It's not recreating resonance. Politically, I think the relevant fight would really be I'm not even sure. As I said, I don't want to think of politics all the time about fight battling, right? I'm who who do I have to kill next? I mean, it's almost symbolically killing someone. So so the question is how can we reshape the world, right? <laughs> Collectively. I mean, that would be really great. I I do believe in institutions like the EU or the UN, right? Uh, but but the, uh, there is a big task ahead, a political challenge, and this is how do we get out of this logic of dynamic stabilization, right? Because that's really also what's driving international struggle and competition, of course. And um, uh, so we do, we would have, um, uh, we, we do need an institutional reshaping of the world, which, for example, I have, I have the idea. I really believe, you know, we have this gra gra grave, uh, this very serious inequalities in the world, right, between rich and poor on all levels. And I think really, I have three ideas which I would like to pursue. One is, an, 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 actually I'm, I'm in favor of a universal basic income. Of course, you could somehow adopt it to the living conditions. In, in, in Paris, it's more than in, I don't know, in Zaire, for example, right? But nevertheless, the idea, I think now, with Marx, I would say, we have raised productivity to such a high level that we, that, Material existence is no longer a problem. It's only a problem because we are incapable of distributing things correctly, right? So I think, uh, so I'm in favor of an, an, an unconditional basic income. It would take fear out of the out of the out of everyday life, right? The, because you know, it's the fear of of suffering social death that makes the world basically look like a, a, a point of aggression. So a universal basic income, but how do you finance is it, of course, is the next question. Mm -hmm. And my idea is to have a global uh, hereditary tax, 
I mean, because you know, inequality is no, it's not so much produced through income or work. It's produced through through the logic of capital, but mainly through through uh, heritage, right? You know, I'm erbe, right? I mean, and and therefore, and and this is against the whole logic of distribution in modern system that it should be yourself who, who gains something. So I think a global hereditary tax, for example, and a global um, uh, basic income would be good ideas. And the other idea I have is really, I think, you know, the main driver for growth and acceleration is not even competition between companies. Maybe we could keep that because the markets are very efficient instruments of allocating resources. Uh, resources, uh, but it's the logic of the financial markets. These, these financial markets, which have really run havoc. I mean, they they, they are going crazy. I mean, the, the interesting thing is that we, the, the, in the last decades, the the, the quantity of money has has grown up. I, th I believe by thirty percent or so. Or, no, it has tripled. While the the real economy only has grown a little. So I really think of we somehow have to tame. The, the financial markets and maybe to nationalize them or to, uh, to yeah, yeah well, I mean, I always, I never understood it. I mean, I, I do understand that, as I said, competition on a certain level and markets might be quite important or useful to distribute resources and, uh, and goods. But I never understood why banks should compete compete with each other. Why do we make money into a commodity which for which we? I know. That, I mean, bankers hate that argument. But I would think along those lines, we need some f sort of reform of this sense in order to get out of the logic of uh, dynamic stabilization and find uh, something like a logic of adaptive stabilization, as I call it. And there might be. I mean, of course, there will be struggle involved in that. It has to do with the different levels, right? I, I think what you really see in Europe, but you actually see it all over the world, but in Europe you see it now very clearly, the main, the, the main images which we evoke politically, even the political debates, particularly when you think of Europe, are about building fences, building walls, and having tanks and warships at the zones, right? And uh, that's the idea of really, that's really the idea of shutting ourselves off from the world. Now, philosophically, I look at this, what does it mean? It means that the world coming to us, this foreign thing, not really controllable, right? The, 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 the alien voice of the world is perceived as a threat. The world which is coming to me, oh no, let's keep it out. I don't want any Muslims here. I don't want any blacks here, whatever it is, right? I mean, so, so I, th I would really say that the existential feeling that drives our politics is the feeling of utter danger, right? The, the, the other which is coming, you can see them in the eyes if you want to, you can hear their voices. It's dangerous, I don't want to see it, I don't want to hear it. And that's, I interpret this as being, being placed in the world in a very precarious conditions, right? The other is perceived as the threat, and that's exactly what I want to get at. It's a sociologie aux relations au monde, the Weltbeziehung, right? So I would say there seems to be a basic mistake there, and, and if I'm a bit right, if I'm right on that, then what we are really lacking is self-confidence in the way you say. Because, I mean, people think if we let the foreigners come in, then we disappear. Then we, That's what they always say. Then we are lost. Then our churches will be converted to, Muslim, to minarets. You can only think that if you believe that we have nothing to say ourselves, that our own voices will not be heard, right? I mean, we, we do have a tradition and a conviction and values. And yes, we make them heard and defend them. But yes, we are capable of listening to someone having other cultures, other traditions. And this is exactly what makes us alive and capable of, capable of living, transforming. Because you can see historically, I think that's very obvious, as a society which tries to kind of uh, build walls and fences and not change at all. Identity politics, we in France are such and such, and we could certainly never change. This is a society doomed for, for, for destruction. I mean, it's not just a symbolic thing, right? I mean, I don't really think that, it, that it's psychological. I mean, it has a, certainly has a psychological element, but uh, it's not that we just need to change political rhetorics. I mean, we need to give people, I mean, you know what I really think is, po politics is in a certain sense powerless. Because the logic, I mean, maybe I'm a kind of, I'm a kind of uh, disguised Marxist in that sense. I mean, yeah, because Marx's idea is that the real subject of change and politics is the logic of capital accumulation, right? And the, uh, capital accumulation for him is uh, money, commodity, money prime. And that's exactly what I mean by dynamic stabilization, right? Without taking it originally from Marx. You need to increase, for example, to get economic growth. 
And that's what politicians do. I mean, they only the differences between politicians, political parties, even if you go to someone extreme as Trump, the difference between Trump and Europe is they have different visions of how to achieve growth. Trump says, yes, I will achieve growth by cutting us off. And the Europeans say, no, no, you will achieve growth by economic, uh, by global trade. But, but the thing is that the real subject is the necessity to achieve growth. And, and what I always say is that the institutions, the economies, the, the companies, they do not achieve growth and innovation and acceleration by themselves. They need our energy, our physical energy, environmental energy, and even uh, political energy. You, 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 you know, I mean, the, the energy comes from the people. And if you need more and more energy every year, then you are not the political subject. So it's not a kind of symbolical thing to give us back, uh, to, to give us back um, um, confidence, right? There, there needs to be real substance. And the way to do this is get out of the cycle of dynamic stabilization. Mm -hmm. That's why I always say, you know, some people say, well, Rosa Resonance, that's a kind of luxury thing, right? That's if you are totally satisfied, you have enough money and everything, you can think of resonance. And I always say, no, resonance is a really revolutionary concept, right? It requires that we make a big revolution. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, I mean, the, you mean it might be important to have roots in order. I think probably I could I could follow this line of argument by turning it a bit into, but but uh, twisting the language. I, I think what is important is that you have your own voice, which you developed, right? I mean, of course, you you will not be in resonance if you let yourself if you let yourself be touched by everything that comes your way, right? I mean, right? I mean, you're totally affected by today. I believe I'm a Muslim, and to, tomorrow I'm a Buddhist, and the next day I'm a Christian, whom, whomever I encounter, right? And today I like rock music, and tomorrow jazz, and the day after soul, or whatever it is. That's that's not resonance because then you lose the capacity to answer, right? To have your own voice. Uh, as I say it, so in that sense, yes, you need to have a sense of how you developed and who you have become. But uh, it doesn't mean that you kind of freeze that. Since these are my the, my roots, I have to stay there, right? This the voice is permanently transformed by encountering others and speaking with others. So if it's a root concept which says I have to stay with my roots and not change at all, it's identity, who I am, and I will not change, then you're already dead. So that doesn't help, right? But if you mean uh, that you have a sense of what your voice is and what your convictions are and what you have to insert into the into the concert of democracy or resonance. Well, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, I do agree, say, for pragmatic reasons, we cannot, I believe that probably, I mean, we cannot just open up the borders. I'm pretty sure because my, my at least my fear is, I'm not even completely sure. I really always thought I want to have a, a thorough empirical analysis of this, but I believe it might be wrong. If, let's say, Europe just opens the borders, then probably the consequence of this will be not that that, that the world will be a better place, but that Europe will be a, a kind of chaotic place, right? Then we really lose our voice and our capacity and... So we cannot, so you cannot, for pragmatic reasons, just do away with borders. If I think of the best of all worlds, would that have borders? I mean, not borders in the sense of violently keeping people away, but borders in the sense of differences between forms of life. This I believe. I mean, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have to be national borders, because in the history there, for a long time, it was national borders. There were not even nations. But I always say that resonance requires that you are closed enough. I mean, you only uh, kind of, uh, of uh, w w you know, my argument always is if you have a, if you have a porous body, like a, a violin made out of styropor, st styropor, you know, this material, very porous material, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It will not sound, right? So you have to have a kind of, you have to be closed. You have to have borders in order to sound, right? But you have to be open enough in order to be touched and affected by something else. So it's this uh, balance between openness and closeness. But some sense of borders, I would say, probably we need not only as physical beings, but also as social group, but not, not necessarily and hopefully not a uh, kind of uh, hostile borders, which, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not easy, but I think you can put these two things together. I really realize, I mean, right now in Germany, and I guess it's the same in other countries, right? I mean, in, in Germany, Germany is now turning like every other country. We have a lot of right-wing populists, anti-immigration, and we have a political culture which is turning quite in a bad direction, right? I mean, it's, it's quite threatening. Yesterday, Angela Merkel 
I lost her. I mean, her, her, uh, the, you know, the, the, the guy who leads the, the, the party in parliament, right? Uh, she didn't get her, her guy, so it was someone else now. So, so, so you, maybe even Germany is turning into a kind of chaotic country. But, um, so, but so now the media said, well, we need to talk to each other, right? Uh, Steinmeier, our president, said, well, we don't talk, we, we yell and we need to go back to talking, right? But I realized, so, so for example, the Zeit, or was it the Spiegel, one, one of the two set up, a, they really brought together people who, who have opposing political um, positions, particularly on the immigration, and they said, sit down and talk. But the, pro the problem in my view is that they start talking about controversial issues, right? Some say, let's open the borders, and the others say, let's close the borders. And some say, I don't know, higher wages, and the others say, lower wages. And then you immediately kind of are in this, what I always call the mode of aggression, right? No, you're wrong, we need more foreigners know you're right, whatever, right? So I think we should change the perspective and that would be the vision, right? We should, we should really ask people and give them a sense that what they say matters. Let's think about what would be the world, what, what would the world look like in which you would want to live, right? What, what is the society worth living in? I think, you know, the, the right-wing populist and the left-wing populist or whatever, they shouldn't talk about each other about having immigrants or not. But give me your, I actually I just tried it in a dialogue because there was someone, we, we kind of were kind of getting angry with each other. And the, guy, the, the one guy said, well, you want open border, you want to destroy Germany. And I said, well, and you want tanks on the border or what? And then you realize that's a very bad uh, way of dealing with each other. So I said, well, tell me, what is the society you, you would like to live in? What would it look like? And I said, certainly you don't want tanks on the border. Of course he didn't want to, right? And I don't want chaos either. So you really see, you get out of this impasse by asking yourself and others, what's the vision of the good life? And I think then we would actually realize we are not so different from each other. I, I would really think that maybe many people in the Front National and on the, on the, on the how do you call this, the uh, gauche, uh, La France, the Maison, yeah, the Maison, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they might have quite similar visions of what a good life is. And uh, so I think we should start the dialogue. What, what would Europe look like, uh, the best of all, the possible Europe? How can we shape it? What I always say is we need to get back this sense of let's really shape the form of life together and come up with visions. And, and there were processes of visions, but they were always supposed to be totally utopian. Mm -hmm. Just dream a bit without, and that of course is lacking the sense of political self-efficacy, right? So we need to have a process which has really political relevance and which is not done by what you want to do away with, but which is led by the idea of what's your vision. That's the best I can think of.